this week on the 215, the ladies tap up a storm. Also, the dessert champ is here. Plus, it's Black Star Film Fest season. And lastly, it's the orchestral sounds of Philadelphia. Welcome into the 215. I'm your host tonight, Breland Moore. So Mike Jarek, well, he has the evening off, but that's okay. You can still hang out with me, right? We're in the Callow Hill section of Philadelphia, hanging out at the rail park. And before we kind of take a little journey around here, I want to introduce you to our first story just right off the bat. Tap dancing has been around since 1900, and dancers would often collaborate with jazz musicians, but in 2023, these ladies still keeping that tradition alive. I mean, for me, for me, it's pure joy. It seems a little bit out of the ordinary, but really it gets us back to the roots of the art form. The Lady Hoofers, we are an all-women tap company based here in Philadelphia. We're dedicated to creating new choreography in tap, but also preserving the tradition of improvisation. We celebrated our 10th anniversary a few years ago, so we're going on 12 years now. For many years, been a male-dominated art form, or certainly the names that we uh, are most familiar with, Savion Glover, Gregory Hines, Fred Astaire, and so on. There have been women in tap since, since, the, uh, since the beginning, and they don't tend to get as much um, opportunity to present their work and choreography and so on. I think, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons for it. Historically, you know, there's sexism in the arts that happens. I think also because tap is a musical form, uh, a lot of times male dancers are louder, they're heavier on their feet, so women, you know, literally get drowned out. So it was important to us to have a platform for women to come together and celebrate this art form. I love the rhythm, I love the sounds, and like we can just get down and dirty. People have different preferences, what kinds of taps they like. I've got one on the front, on the back. That's what makes all the magic. Being a part of an all-female tap ensemble is just empowering. And we definitely support each other 100%. And as we're dancing, we feel it. You feel the love, you feel the support. Yes, we all uplift each other. Tap's definitely having a moment right now. The fact that you guys are out here on a pier. Yes. Fold up floors. Yeah. What's, what's the deal with that? As a vernacular dance form, tap really came out of West African music and dance tradition. People were making music and dance with, with barely anything. So when we think about tap, being out here on a pier is not actually all that crazy. It seems a little bit out of the ordinary, but really it gets us back to the roots of the art form. We participate in outreach a lot. We go to Moffa Elementary and we push into the fifth grade class and we teach them how to tap dance and we just show what we love about tap dance and hopefully it passes on to the next generation and we can keep it alive and keep it moving and, and just show the world that, hey, we are here. So for more information, you can just go to ladyhoofers.org. Well, let's get to our next story, which is extremely tasty. Everybody loves a winner, especially here in Philadelphia. And uh, I think we also are a pretty big dessert town, at least I personally am. Now we're going to head to Cribal Bakery. They actually won a Dessert Wars championship, and uh, they're going to go represent our city in a national contest. I found the world of cakes, I found that I love cakes, and I ended up kind of falling into being a business owner. <laughs> half birthday, half cake. <laughs> so I started baking out of a friend's kitchen, and that just turned into this. I would say that the dream to have my own bakery started in high school, in tech school. Uh, I started doing some competitions there, and I started winning competitions there. It's going to be light blue, and we'll go with this one. I've got this passion for competing that has stuck with me ever since high school. So anytime I get a chance to compete and win, that's, you know, <laughs> that's the best. <laughs> 
So Dessert Wars was insane, and we had 51 teams competing, all small local bakers. You know, they announced third place, it wasn't us. They announced second, it wasn't us. They announced first, and I was like, are you kidding me? But once it starts to boil, the molecules of the sugar, they split, and then if it jumps up on the sides, it can crystallize and jump back into the sugar and crystallize the whole batch. There's the science of it and doing it the way it's supposed to be done. And then the art part. I've met so many artists that have turned into cake decorators in their careers just because they get to have that creative outlet. So I'm gonna start with switching the tip. This person wants a red cake with purple balloons on it. This person wants a pink cake with flowers on it. I get my creative outlet on every single cake and it's different every day. What really like fuels me and gets me going is knowing I'm going into work today and I'm gonna make a dragon. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna do today. What are you doing at work today? <laughs> I'm making a dragon. The sky's the limit. You know, people show us cake pictures and we say, we'll use this as inspiration and we will create our own piece of art based on the inspiration photos that they send. So cute. There's something about baking that is so satisfying. It's putting things together and creating something that goes from nothing to something. Then you make it pretty. Then you hand it to somebody and they're so happy that they cry. Every time we make a cake for somebody and it makes them happy, I consider that a personal success. I get that heartfelt feeling, you know, keep pleasing the world with the cakes. A cake always makes somebody smile and that's a huge accomplishment in a baker's life. If you want to go check them out, they are located in Norristown. Well, coming up after the break, we're going to, of course, check out the rail park a little bit more and also head to the Black Star Film Fest. Still, of course, hanging out here at the rail park, and we're going to get some more information on this location in just a little bit. But first, we're going to head to the Black Star Film Festival. It's well-renowned for just bringing films to the city that push the boundaries of filmmaking. And this year, they have roughly 100 films in a brand-new location. So ready. Black Star Film Festival was founded in 2012. Initially, we were focused on black filmmakers from the African diaspora. We've now expanded to focus on black, brown, and indigenous filmmakers from all over the globe. So what's special and what's different about this year's festival? Oh, every year is special and different <laughs> at the Black Star Film Festival. We're moving this year, so the festival will be taking place on South Broad Street. We'll be at the Kimmel Center. We'll be at Lightbox at University of the Arts, and we'll be at Susan Roberts Theater. We are a rigorous festival. We have very high standards for the work that we show. We're really interested in films that are um, engaged with social justice. We're interested in films that have a really high aesthetic value, that are pushing up against genre, that are interested in pushing the form of cinema. The opening night film is really exciting. It's called Girl. Will you tell me the story? It's by a, uh, a Scottish black filmmaker, and it's this really beautifully shot mother-daughter story. And you waited and waited. I almost give up hope. Yes. But then I came along. Fire Through Dry Grass is a really exciting film uh, that's having its world premiere at Black Star this year. I say, no, we're not OK. That film is about a group of disabled poets and writers who make this film about their own experience of uh, living through the pandemic in their nursing home in New York. And only now, after weeks of leaving the infected in bedrooms with the uninfected, are they starting to separate us. Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni project. So you're sort of a prophet. 
I, I would hate to think of myself as being a prophet. <laughs> prophets die. They always, the prophets and saints well, don't always we all? die. <laughs> yeah, but they do it sooner. People are going to love that because it's about Nikki Giovanni. It's also a film that um, tackles so many things like aging, um, the life of an artist. What I'm trying to do with my writing is to bring out a reality. I'm, I'm what they call a personal poet. And I try to bring out the, the personality of my life, you know. Outside of the films, what are some of the things that will take place throughout those five days? So much. <laughs> we have our opening and closing night parties. We have panels, talks, and conversations taking place inside the Kimmel Center, which we're calling the Daily Job Stage. We're doing interviews with a lot of the filmmakers and panelists from the festival. Um, and we'll also have some live podcast recordings. When you look at what this has grown into, like, what's your thoughts or your, your feeling on it since it started out as just like, look, there's a couple films that I want to know why they're not here, so I'm going to do something to bring them here, and now you're recognized globally for the work that you guys are doing. Uh, I mean, it's tremendous. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm still in shock and awe sometimes at um, the people who are interested in the work that we're doing. Even the staff that we have, we're up to 21 people full time. And um, sometimes when we gather, I just look around the room and I kind of can't believe that all these people are working on these projects that were like ideas in the back of my mind. Um, and so I'm just, I feel like humbled is like an overused word and I need to find something else, but I'm definitely uh, grateful for this moment and these opportunities and that audiences still find the work that we're doing relevant. So the festival runs from August 2nd to the 6th and you can just head on down to their website right here on the bottom of your screen for some more information here. But right now I'm hanging out with Vanessa. She's with Friends of the Rail Park. How are you doing today? First of all, it's a beautiful day to be out here um, just walking the rail park with you. No, it's a beautiful day. It's a little hot, yeah. uh, but it's a beautiful <laughs> day and we're happy to be having you here. Thank you for coming. So for people who don't know, this is kind of a staple here in the Callow Hill neighborhood yes. area. When did the rail park open and kind of give me some background information on that for people who are unfamiliar. Absolutely. So we are on phase one of the rail park right now um, and it opened in June of 2018. So we recently celebrated our five year anniversary, which is very exciting. Um, the rail park actually started advocacy back in the early 2000s when neighbors and community members got together and said, we want to transform this space, which was originally an abandoned railroad line into usable green space. So it's a quarter mile stretch of park. So it's not incredibly long, but we mm -hmm. found a way to kind of place different art installations along the walking path so that you're able to find something to do for whether it's you and your dog or you and your family members, you and your friends. Um, so we have a story wall back at the front Noble Street entrance of the park, um, which tells a bit of the history of uh, the area that the rail park is located in. We also have Dawn Chorus, which is another art installation located about halfway through the park. Um, there's an incredible mural at a building adjacent to the rail park, and then we also have these big oversized string or oversized swings which speak to the industrial design of the rail park which I think is a really unique feature of the park. So you said this is phase one. one. Yes. What's planned for the future? So there is a full three mile vision for the rail park. Wow. Yeah, so our goal is to connect 10 Philadelphia neighborhoods from Brewery Town all the way to Northern Liberties with open green space. So there's three other phases of development that we're looking at known as the viaduct, the cut, and the tunnel. The viaduct portion spurs right off of the edge of phase one, and it covers the length of track that used to spur towards Reading Terminal that's now been cut off from the Vine Street Expressway and then spurs back into Northern Liberties. Uh, the cut section, passes through the um, Community College of Philadelphia campus, which is really exciting because that campus doesn't have a whole lot of green space, so we're excited to bring more green space to that community. And then the tunnel portion runs underneath Pennsylvania Avenue between 22nd and 27th Street. So it's a pretty big project, and when it's finished, it'll be three miles of walking path. That is going to be incredible. When is it scheduled to be finished? We're looking at about a 10-year timeline, a hopeful 10-year timeline for completion. That's going to be incredible. So, Vanessa, 
you were telling me earlier that you guys just kind of celebrated your signature event yes. here, the Block Party. Yeah. What is that for people who are unfamiliar? Yes, so the Block Party is our signature annual event. This was our third year doing it, but this one was a little bit different. We actually incorporated a music festival into this Block Party as well. So in addition to having the park space activated with community partners, different vendors, craft, um, craft activities for friends and family, uh, we had a screen printing station, DJ. Um, in addition to what was on the park, we also had a music festival in the parking lot directly below the park. So we had a few different musical performances. We had a small beer garden as well. And it was an incredible turnout. We had over 3,000 people join us throughout the day. Um, and we're looking, forward to, to, we're looking forward to doing it again in 2024. That sounds incredible. So the yeah. block party is your, your main event, the signature yes. event. But you guys do a ton of other stuff yes. throughout yeah. the year correct yes absolutely so we are in summer which is our peak programming season so we're always hosting different events to bring different community members neighbors and families out to the park our next event that will be coming up is on August 9th we're having a volunteer happy hour cleanup which is a great opportunity to come out um, and help steward the park by picking up trash pulling weeds and then you get to have a beer with your neighbors and friends afterwards What's which is really than nice. yeah <laughs> um, and then you can also check out our events page on our website for other upcoming events um, we do have have a final Friday series coming up where we're going to be doing different activations on the park on the last Friday of the month um, and then we have other events that we host throughout the year as well. Awesome so come check it out there's tons of things and tons of ways to get involved here uh, there's gonna be two, more 2 on 5 coming your way after this short time out. Five, still hanging out here at the rail park but if you've watched the 215 religiously you know Philadelphia Orchestra has been a fantastic sponsor of this show and no matter where you live in any section of the city it's always going to be our city your orchestra <laughs> The Philadelphia Orchestra was founded right here in Philadelphia in 1900. It's an orchestra today famous for its gorgeous sound, the famous Philadelphia sound. This orchestra is a worldwide entity and we tour all over the world on many different continents in all the greatest concert halls of the world. Our home for many, many decades was the Academy of Music here on Broad Street. And then in the early 2000s, we moved to this beautiful structure, the Kimmel Cultural Campus. The early years of the orchestra were characterized by great adventure and innovation led by legendary music directors, including Leopold Stokowski and later Eugene Ormandy. That zeal for innovation and that wondrous sound that was set up by those early musicians, Stokowski and Ormandy, continues to the present day under the music and artistic directorship of Yannick Nézé-Séguin. We play a wide variety of repertoire, not only the great Beethoven and Bach and Brahms and Tchaikovsky, but we also play music of living composers, of women composers, people of color, and the orchestra is just a great representative of the classical music scene in the United States. Most recently, the famous performances the orchestra has done has been a cycle of the Rachmaninoff piano concertos with the great pianist Yuja Wang, two collaborations with great dance companies such as Brian Sanders's Junk, collaborations with great visual artists such as Rafik Anadol. They perform with the world leading artists of our day. So every season, the biggest names in classical music will appear on the stage of the great Philadelphia Orchestra right here at Verizon Hall. We have played for kings and 
princes and presidents all over the world. I remember playing some incredible performances in China, groundbreaking performances. So really, the nice thing is the orchestra is so beloved around the world that our art and what we offer actually transcends all politics and biases and we just do what we do and represent the city, the commonwealth, the country. Coming down to Center City to have a wonderful dinner out and then come into this beautiful concert hall and hear your great Philadelphia Orchestra is one of the most special experiences of being in this wonderful city. This orchestra for well over 100 years has been a beloved part of the cultural scene in the Delaware Valley. And I don't think it's corny to say that this orchestra is truly the orchestra for the people and of the people in Philadelphia. So um, it just does my heart good whenever I walk out onto that stage to huge applause and see a full house, truly a kaleidoscope of our population. And it's just a real privilege to be a part of it. So for more information on events and other cool stuff, just go to their website right here at the bottom of your screen. Well, keep it right here. More 215 after the break. episode of the 215. Remember to join us back here each Tuesday night at 630. Take care.